una información sobre interpretación. Right now I'm going to introduce Mr. Hugo Santos to provide a message on interpretation. Uh, good afternoon uh, to all, to everybody. In order to provide that uh, language access, we will be providing interpretations into Spanish. So I will go ahead and give the announcement in Spanish and then we can begin. Buenas tardes a todos. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea en español. Si usted es bilingüe, eh, no tiene que presionar nada. Si usted no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, verá un icono en la parte inferior de su pantalla, a la, que, a la derecha, en forma de globo que dice interpretación. Haga clic ahí y seleccione español. Si está usando un iPad o el teléfono, localice el menú de tres puntos en la parte de arriba de su pantalla, haga clic en interpretación de idiomas y elija español. Muchas gracias. We can begin. You're on mute, Mr. Ortega. Thank you. And, uh, can you hear me? Okay. I can't hear myself, so sometimes I need to figure out if you can hear me or not. All right, so I'm going to start with a little short video. I'm going to share my screen right now and a little video about GV that we made for you all. The lack of relationships that I experienced. I love Goleta Valley Junior High. It's one of my favorite places to be. I think about that every day when I talk to our students and to our staff. One of the things that I remember when I was a junior high student is the lack of connectivity that I had, the lack of relationships that I experienced. And it's part of the reason why I do this work on a daily basis. It's that ability to connect with individuals, to connect with our students. Junior high is such a unique age. We get them for such a short time, but really we are that bridge and it is our goal to prepare junior high students for high school and beyond that. Goleta Valley Junior High School counselors believe every student is unique, that they need to feel cared for, that they belong, and that they believe in their own self-efficacy. The best part about GV is really the teachers. Like, they seriously are really good at communicating. A lot of the educators, I can tell, really care about um, the future and the success of the students here about their emotional well-being, about their academic performance, and um, how they're getting along in their day-to-day. -day. I see that and, and I'm really inspired by that, which makes me um, even more happy to be a part of the Mariner family. Los maestros son amigables, uh, quieren mucho los estudiantes, se responsabilizan por ellos, quieren lo mejor cada día para ellos, y sobre todo el director que quiere involucrar a los papás. I was just amazed with the ability that the students had to really be inclusive with one another and to build connection. That all happens when there is leadership that has that type of heart behind those messages. Well, what I appreciate most about Goleta Valley Junior High is our emphasis on building long-lasting relationships with students. I think one of the best things about Goleta Valley is our emphasis on relationships and creating a space for kids to be who they are and to find interest in things that they are passionate about. I really like the after-school activities too. Like last year I did after-school soccer, I did extra Spanish and I could do theater and it all worked together really well. Being able to focus on our sale, our safety, accountability, inclusion, and learning, that is just such a great thing that's so easy to remember for all of us. 
I think people tend to misunderstand the goals of a library. Yes, we are trying to build a community of readers, but the library is also a place for creation. So maybe that's a book for a student, but that also might be something in our makerspace where we have a 3D printer and machines that students can use to create something that expresses their cultural linguistic background. The collaboration we have with DP and GV has been super successful over the years. The students at GV are instilled with the same values around project-based learning, experiential learning, and the other exciting hands-on learning experiences that they get at GV prepare students wonderfully well when they come to high school. We're really teaching kids how to think creatively, how to come up with problem solving that is individual and independent of others with a unique perspective of their own when they solve those problems. We meet weekly, look at our students' work, and make sure we design our curriculum to meet the needs of every single class, no matter what level they're in. This school offers you the best teachers that teach you in the best way they can. And once you make friends, you will have a lot of fun memories here at school. There is such a wide variety of types of people here at GV and so you can really become friends with anyone. This school is so welcoming and made me feel like if I was at home. I think the Mariner spirit is still alive and well here at Goleta Valley, even in distance learning, and I'm really excited to see what we're gonna do next. All right, well, we just wanted to give you a glimpse of what GV is about. And, um, you know, that last quote there of being excited in terms of what we're going to do next is what we're all about. Um, we are excited to have a conversation with our families and our students about what reopening will look like. Uh, but most importantly, we're excited uh, about the outcome of being together once again. And our goal today is to welcome you, but also to give you insight and coherence around what are our reopening plans as they relate to academics, but also as they relate to safety. Uh, one of the things that you heard in the video is our acronym of SAIL, and SAIL represents safety, accountability, inclusion, and learning. And uh, it's a priority of ours. That's our mission. That's what we're here for. Um, and in that mission also includes what we want to do with our students when it comes to academics and also our values grounded on goal setting, um, lifelong learning, equity, respect, and innovation. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, you know, one, one of the things that uh, we want to emphasize here in terms of our reopening plans is that we are waiting for that, that number, that red tier. And that red tier is going to be something we're going to talk about today. Um, it does come with a number of uh, seven over 100,000. And it is based on what the numbers are being projected that's coming to us from the county health. And then eventually that information will carry over to our board. And when that uh, projection is made and that decision is made, we'll be ready to open. Uh, another thing that we're gonna talk about today is uh, safety review application. What does all that look like? And uh, what does it look like for our students? Um, and what does it look like for our parents? And also what does it look like for our staff? And um, we're going to begin today really talking about the, the family choice conversation. Uh, and also what that looks like in terms of academics when students return to hybrid learning in group A, group B, and group C. So what's been happening, where we've been and where we're going? Uh, if you look at the slide right here, um, our certificated staff has received notification of returning back to work. Um, our parents, you all um, have received a student choice confirmation and where we're at right now is um, our staff is scheduled to be here next week, uh, beginning March 10th. And go to the next slide. Uh, what we are waiting for now is board approval of reopening. And so we do stay in tune with the board uh, meetings and special board meetings to see where that discussion is going to lead. 
And you also see what the result will be when that choice is made based on the results that are coming from our county health. Student orientation, uh, that's going to be key for us, uh, especially for our incoming seventh graders. We know that our seventh graders have been here for uh, picture day. They have been here for uh, picking up supplies and library supplies and P supplies and elective supplies, but they haven't quite been in our classrooms and taken a walk. And so one of the things that we have our lens on is that when we do open, we will be dedicating time uh, specifically for our seventh graders to come in um, and get a hold of the landscape of GV and also understand where all of their classes are. So more on that will be coming through Parent Square and communicated to our students as well in terms of what that will look like uh, for opening up orientations. I do wanna add that we do have our Q&A open. So if you have any questions as we're going through this presentation, uh, please ask it. And we have Ms. Chu, uh, Merritt in the background, Mr. Sportell in the background, uh, Ms. Rachel Hatcher Day, uh, Ms. Gonzalez is in the background recording this presentation in Spanish. Uh, and we also have Ms. Cabrera um, as well being able to answer questions. And so uh, I will just um, remind you all and we'll be presenting throughout. And finally, um, what we're waiting for is the student arrival. And that date, that projection, when that will be, uh, will be a decision that will be based again uh, by the county health and also by our board. And once that decision is made, we will have a projected date to let you know. Um, and so when that happens, that's when we begin hybrid in-person learning uh, to begin. So what has happened? Um, we, you've probably heard of the group A, group B, Group C. And if you haven't, uh, group A and B is going to be the hybrid group, and group C is going to be the distance learning group all the way through. Um, we will be finishing up all data entries for these choices, and uh, you will be receiving a parent square on Friday afternoon, uh, letting you know the group selection and what the schedule will look like. Uh, so stay in tune for Friday. Friday is going to be a really important date. But we want to talk a little bit about what group A, B, and C will look like. And so I started looking at some visuals, and uh, this is a visual here that I'm presenting to you all. This big tree is the tree that stands right in front of our school. Um, the icon of the clipboard of the individual looking at the computer, um, that is distance learning, uh, working and logging in from home. The image above uh, really represents what hybrid learning will look like. You will have students who are in person, at school, in the classroom, socially distanced, um, and you will also have students at home. So for example, if a student is in group A, students will be in group A at school. Group B will be logging in from home, and so will Group C. If you are in Group B, Group B will be in person on Tuesday, and on Tuesday, Group A will be logging in from home, and so will Group C. On Wednesday, all groups will be distance learning, very similar to what's happening right now uh, with all of our classes. On Thursday, back to group A and group B and C distance learning. And on Friday, back to group B in person and group A and C distance learning. We will have these slide decks available for you along with the video um, logged into our website. And so if you miss any of this, um, you can go ahead and view it through our website. And also I will be having more principal chats in the coming weeks. Um, as you have more questions that pop up, um, that come up after this presentation. So um, 
In-person hybrid, 100% distance learning. Uh, this is just another just highlighted example of what it can look like. Um, right now, I'm going to just go ahead and hand it over to Ms. Chu, who will talk a little bit about what that curriculum and that pedagogy, what we call pedagogy, but just the strategies that are being used by teachers um, as we're preparing for hybrid instru instruction. Okay. I was answering a question quick there, so I'm going to switch back in here. Um, Yes, yeah, so I, I think what, what's, what stands out to me and what, what's a message we want to help convey to everybody is that every single student, no matter whether they are in group A, group B, or group C, are going to be experiencing um, learning activities and learning experiences that are all focused on the standards, the content, the skills that pertain to that particular um, class. That is the one constant thing they will all share. Um, how that will play out is where it, it, the experience may look differently depending on if I'm a student sitting on campus or am I a student that is sitting at home doing Zoom. So how I interact and what I do with that content at times may look different depending on my, on my group. Um, teachers are working very, very hard, not only in designing lessons, but also in the area of getting comfortable and deciding um, which technology, technology, which tools in that realm are going to support these different learning experiences. So there may be classes where at times all three groups are together somewhat simultaneously, some um, zooming in and seeing something projected, some hearing it in person. And then there are going to be times where different groups are going to have learning experiences that are to their situation, which may mean if I'm in group B, I'm working asynchronously on content that I've um, that my teacher has shared with me. If I'm in person, I'm probably doing mo maybe more collaborative work, um, learning that involves more discussion because I'm in that room with students doing that. And we, one of the words we keep using is this idea of congruent teaching. And that is this notion that teachers are planning for what does that learning look like for the students in front of me? And what does that look like for those that are um, at home? And when we speak to the different vehicles that, that teachers are using, um, there are a range of platforms. You may see your child um, engaging with things called Nearpod or um, Google Classrooms, but Google Classroom, Classroom, can't say that word. But there are different vehicles in that technology realm that teachers are utilizing in order to best fit the learning need depending on the group of students. Um, so again, the constant piece is everybody is focused on the content, the standards, the skills that are, desi that are needed for that content and that class. The difference is at times, depending on what the group is, how they're going to engage with that content. Thank you, Ms. Chu. Um, yeah, that's very important. I switched over to Group C because I do want to highlight that, you know, right now we have Group C, uh, group C with everybody. Um, and as we transition with Group C, uh, these two icons really represent logging in, checking in, and being able to log in with your classes if you're in Group C and be able to see the students who are physically there, uh, but also being able to see the group uh, that is working remotely for that day. And the icon on the left is the idea of autonomy um, and having a certain level of autonomy for that day. And so that's going to be really important. Yes, teachers will develop a schedule um, and letting students know what they will need to be doing uh, with what we call release time. There, there's usually a time where a teacher will model what's going to take place uh, during the lesson, and then they will go ahead and do some guided practice. And then there's release time. Release time is that time where students are able to work independently, um, and students are able to also seek input as they're working independently. And so as Ms. Chu was referencing the idea of technology being a vehicle for delivering instruction, uh, that is a concept and that was uh, really brought up by uh, a speaker, a writer, an author, a, a Harvard uh, author, Alan November. And he indicated that technology is not the tool in which we instruct about 
but rather it is a vehicle that we use to deliver our instruction. And so there's multiple vehicles out there, a plethora of them. And it's really finding out the ones that our teachers have been using, that they're familiarized with, uh, and also finding new tools as we get into these rapid systems of transition and change. Nearpod is a newer one that is coming up um, and we have found that it has a lot of potential, but so does Google Classroom and so does Google Doc. The idea here is that we are using platforms where students can interact and where students can log in and communicate and collaborate. Um, if you think about a regular website, you can't do that with just a regular website. But if you think about all the websites that are out there now, they're all catered towards collaboration. It used to be called Web 1.0. All these platforms now are called Web 2.0 platforms. Um, so really important to note. So what does this mean in terms of safety? Our board, our district cabinet, and here at school as well, we have been using a model and an analogy of the Swiss cheese um, analogy. And, and really this analogy is of that each intervention, and uh, uh, it's actually layered there, equals a layer, a layer of protection. Uh, but each of these layers has holes, meaning that if we only rely on one, it is not enough. But if we start relying on a variety of these layers, the more layers that we have, the more safety, the, the higher uh, or the lower the risk and the higher uh, our ability is to ensure that when students arrive here at school, following these protocols, they leave safely heading back home. And so uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to our Dean of Student Engagement, who we've been working collaboratively, uh, but he's been our point person in really ensuring that a lot of these safety measures are there. And I'll have him speak up uh, to these layered effects and kind of what our COVID safety plan looks like. Mr. Sportel. Thank you, Mr. Ortega. Uh, as we look at the Swiss cheese model, um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, bring context to is the fact that all of our safety plans have been developed in conjunction with the Santa Barbara County Health Department. So where you may have seen this, this model before may be in reference to state and county guidelines for health. So all of the things that are in our plan are developed along the same guidelines and with the same guidance, but also know that the things that we're doing have been um, contractually attested to by our school district as a, a contingent criteria for us to open when we get to red tier. So as we go through these things, um, know that they're all rooted in these um, attestations that we've made to uh, Santa Barbara County. And if you want to reference that document, it is available on our website. So um, some of the uh, aspects I wanna talk to you about are things that occur really prior to any students coming onto campus. If we look at the next slide, um, it talks about our testing protocols for staff. All staff are going to be tested every two weeks. So we have a process that we're developing at school. We're gonna begin testing all of our staff next week. By the week's end, we will have tested every staff that works on our campus. And so really, um, quite likely prior to any student arriving on campus that's not in a current cohort, we will have all of our staff tested. So this testing occurs right at our school site. So all of our staff will come in, they all have an appointment and they, we take those samples and then that goes to the lab and we get those back right away. And this is happening district-wide. Um, along the lines of testing, we will also have the capacity for testing of our students under certain conditions. And I think uh, this slide illustrates what those conditions might be. We have a, a reactive protocol that is in place whenever we have a student who presents symptoms while at school. Uh, currently, we have cohorts on campus and a lot of these practices have already been in development. And for many of them, we've had some practice in responding to the needs that arise. One of the things that we haven't had an opportunity to respond to is a student who reports as symptomatic at school, but we do have protocols in place. And we have uh, a protocol of 
providing a isolated area for the student to be in to ensure that there isn't any uh, possibility of spread from that point. And then we release that student to their parents and uh, recommend that, they're, uh, that, that they see a doctor. We also follow that same protocol when we have staff. So in the event that we have a student who is symptomatic at school, we will provide that testing. Again, it is a voluntary, so it is not something that's required, but we do have that available. Also, if a family reports to us that there was a close contact of somebody who lives maybe in the same household or that a student spent significant time with, then we can provide testing for that person. Do understand that under both of those conditions, this will also involve that we quarantine the student from school, from the school population for a period of 10 to 14 days. Um, all, of the, all of the reactive um, steps that we take are really um, coordinated with our district nurses. So the site admin, while we've learned a lot about what protocols need to be in place and what are the criteria for quarantine, we actually defer to our district nurses who are in direct contact with Santa Barbara County health officials. And the third um, uh, possibility is if a parent or guardian has a significant reason to request a COVID test. And we are endeavoring to be able to provide all of these free of charge to families. All right, so the next layer of defense that happens before we come to school um, before students come onto the campus is the IPAS. And Mr. Sportell, I, I just want to add a little bit about the IPAS as Mr. Sportell, Sportell explains it. The IPAS is going to be connected with our ARIES management system. And so when you have this upcoming Friday, we will be sending confirmation of the group A, B, and C. So once that confirmation enters into ARIES, you will see IPASS update. If you were to go now, you will see students who are in distance learning saying that they're attending remotely. But once it changes, you will be able to see the group A, group B, group C on the days they come in. Thank you, yes. Uh, the IPASS is really a, a, a way for parents to help us ensure that students are coming to school um, healthy without symptoms and also to notify us if there have been any other conditions that might put them at risk for um, having uh, a positive COVID test or, or contracting COVID. And the system will work um, like this. Parents will receive an, a daily email. They usually come around 5 or 6 a.m. There will be a link presented on that email. When you click the link, you will answer a series of questions. So here you see depicted in this slide what the email looks like that parents will receive. If you look on the following slide, you will see an example of the COVID screening questions. These questions are related to any symptoms. They are related to travel um, more than two hours away from home or outside of the state. They're related to any social gatherings that you may have attended or that the student has been a part of. And finally, they will ask if there is a, a temperature of above 100.4 degrees. And this is really our cutoff for determining that uh, the risk is there. And so we're gonna take precautionary measures. In addition to this IPASS pre-screening, we will be screening every person that enters the campus uh, for, with a thermometer check and no touch no touch thermometer check. So we have, we'll have a series of screening checkpoints for staff and students. And as they come through, we're gonna verify that this IPASS has been completed and we're gonna check the temperature of every person. On the following slide, you will see what the codes are for students who can enter campus or who are practicing remotely uh, with no um, risk conditions presented. So students who are entering campus on that particular day will answer that they do not have any symptoms. Parents will answer that the student doesn't have any symptoms and that they will be entering campus. Under those conditions, they'll receive a green badge as you see depicted 
down below here. So when you press this on your computer or iPhone or iPad, then the page will automatically turn to this QR code badge and it will display a color. If you expect to have your student arrive at school that day and you don't have a green badge, then go back and review the questions and make sure that you've answered them in the way that you intended. We have had a lot of experience using iPass already, and I will let you know that there have been uh, multiple occasions in which someone indicated that they were not experiencing any symptoms, including a fever, and then answered the next question that they had a fever. And in those cases, um, it was almost in every case, it was a mistake. So if you don't see that green badge and you're getting ready to leave for school, you want to go back and double check the questions. Um, those answers can be changed, by the way, if there is an update in, in symptoms. The blue badge will be presented in the event that you're not experiencing, your child is not experiencing any COVID symptoms, but you plan to work remotely that day. So that would be your, maybe that's on a Wednesday, for example then you'll get the blue badge. So you wanna really pay attention once you've completed that questionnaire to the color that comes back. If it comes back any other color than blue or green and you are not having any family health changes or any um, risk conditions presented, then you wanna go back and check. All right. Great, thank you, Mrs. Um, Sporto. Um, yeah, the iPass is a really intuitive piece of technology that uh, we've been using with our cohorts right now. And um, it is going to be a process that allows us to see which students have checked in, which students have not. Uh, teachers in their classrooms will also have access to that. And so they'll be able to see which students have checked in, which students have not. Um, and really the goal here is to run this with efficacy. And, you know, what we've been saying is we've had plenty of time to practice and I'm going to channel my old uh, coaching times and really say that how we practice is how we perform. And we've been practicing quite a while now and we are ready uh, to perform when our students come back in full hybrid. And so um, more questions on iPads, always feel free to put them in the, in the Q&A. Um, and if you have any questions later on, by all means, uh, let us know. In addition to all this is transportation. And so um, one of the things that we want to emphasize on transportation is that we have been in communication with MTD uh, across all the schools and starting to look at the routes. And so all the previous routes will be active um, and they will be following protocols as well. And they'll be following um, social distancing guidelines, uh, as well as um, wearing masks. And, uh, you know, I found this clip art and I thought, oh, how appropriate for our students in the world in which we currently live in. Um, and I put MTD there because they are the primary uh, individuals that will help us with transportation. And the routes will be hyperlinked so that when we put this back on our website, you'll be able to see the various different routes we have. And so all four booster buses will be running and uh, we will be sending out information as it becomes available once we get the green light that we're ready to open. Okay, so this slide right here is really talking about our new policy implementations. It's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to really dive deep into what these policies represent. And so we will be providing policies for our students for mask guidelines. Uh, one of the things that we want to emphasize is that everything that we've provided in our safety plans, everything that we've said we're going to do, we've had to submit what's called an attestation, which is really telling the county that we are doing everything that we are writing. And so the mask guidelines are required and they will be required by our students. And so we will be providing guidance of reminding students that if they're not wearing the mask, they have to wear them. Uh, there's an exception to mask wearing, and that's going to be while they're eating and while they're drinking uh, fluids. And so uh, that's the only exception. All others, they will have, be required to wear their masks. Guidelines for hand washing, we will be providing various different areas for hand washing stations uh, and also for sanit um, hand sanitizers. 
Uh, we have hand sanitizers in every single room, along with our multi-purpose room, the cafeteria, the auditorium. Um, and we will also be having hand washing stations throughout the school as well. So there'll be multiple opportunities for students to be washing their hands. And these will be guidelines of what they'll need to do. Uh, in addition to that, we will be reminding them, but we're not relying solely on reminders. Uh, we will have plans in place uh, to make sure that the students have proper time to do it uh, and also a guide of how to do it. Guidelines for transitions, uh, we will have those two uh, transitions in terms of what that looks like when they get dropped off, what it looks like when they transition from one class to the next during passing period, what transition will look like during lunch, and what transition will look like as they're leaving. We will go over that in more detail in our slides to come, um, but these guidelines will also be posted on our website. So what does that mean in terms of safety? Uh, it means that the best way, the safe way is the best way. Uh, and really these pictures right here is what's happening right now with our cohorts and also the prep work that our custodial crew has been doing and continues to do along with the social distancing checkpoints that we will have. Uh, closed campus for students and guests. Um, so what does that mean? It means that students get dropped off. We will be providing a time for when parents can drop students off. That time will be 8 a.m. And one, one of the key things about that is that we will not be able to have students arrive prior to that. And the reason for that is because we want to make sure that all of our checkpoints, all of our entry points, have the proper trained staff to be able to bring students in. Uh, without that, we can't bring students in. And at the earliest that we're gonna start bringing staff in, it's going to be around 7.50. It will allow us time to set up and be ready to receive students uh, beginning at eight. So do keep that time in mind. We will send out a guideline for that um, as the hybrid opening uh, timeline kicks in. Physical distancing, uh, also there. Uh, lanyards and ID cards. We took on the steps to order lanyards for every single one of our students. Um, and ID cards, all of our students have. If they don't have them, they will be able to get an ID card through our school library. We have an ID printer there. And what is that lanyard for? That lanyard is going to include their ID, but it's also going to include the QR code that Mr. Sportel showed on the iPass. That's going to be a good route and we uh, the checkpoints are really going to be scanners. And the scanners are as simple as an iPad or an iPhone uh, of key individuals that have been trained to scan and also check temperatures. Um, we ordered, I believe about 2000 lanyards. And so we want our students to feel safe at all times, but also their social well-being to feel well. If a student loses a lanyard, we want them to just simply ask for another one. Uh, we don't wanna give them a hard time about losing their lanyard. We wanna just provide another one because the key here is safety and that they're able to um, come to school in a safe and efficient way. Um, COVID compact is an agreement. Uh, that is an agreement that's very similar to our student and family compact. And so we'll be providing that to our students so that way they understand what these guidelines represent and what procedures will need to take place. Um, I wanna highlight something in the images that we have showing here at the bottom. Every morning when our custodial crew arrives, they will be opening up all the windows to the classrooms. As our teachers arrive, they will be opening up all the doors to the classroom and leaving the doors open at all time. So what does that mean? That means that as you check the weather, if you see a cold and chilly day approaching, please make sure that you remind your students to wear proper layered clothing. Uh, that's going to be key. I have twin boys and I have to remind them that all the time as they go into their classes every day, um, as they're attending now and Layering clothing is better than not having the clothing to keep yourself warm. Uh, we are still in rainy seasons. 
Uh, and so we are anticipating rain next week. And I'm sure we're anticipating some cold, chilly days in the weeks to come. And so do please keep that in mind. So now we're going to dive a little deep into the re-entry timeline. The first one's in English and the second one will be in Spanish. Um, but we'll go ahead and have them online. Um, go ahead, Mrs. Portel. Thank you, Mr. Ortega. Uh, you see here a map of our school. And what I want to draw your attention to are the entry checkpoints for students. Um, as I mentioned before, we also have uh, an entry checkpoint for staff, but here in this map, you'll see the entry checkpoints we have for students, and they're color-coded uh, to tell them apart. So you'll see that the orange here is for students arriving via bicycle. We have uh, yellow here is the front of the school where we have some pedestrians and we have some students arriving by vehicle drop-off. And then over in green, we have students that will arrive uh, via the MTD bus and also some pedestrians. And then up here in the purple are the students that may arrive via Cathedral Oaks. So each of these areas has a checkpoint and that is the place where the screening will happen. So students will have their badges checked. We'll be providing lanyards that have the QR code and staff will be at the checkpoint. We'll scan the QR code ensure that the self-certification process has been completed, and then also check students' temperature. We are asking that students arrive between the times of eight o'clock and 8.30. Class begins at 8.30. Um, in that time when a student may arrive early at say eight o'clock or 8.05, and prior to them being released to go to their classroom at about 8.50, we have these separate waiting areas for students that will be supervised. Each one corresponds to one of the entry checkpoints. Going back to the IPASS certification and the badge scanning process that we're gonna be completing, if there is some mishap uh, in which a student's family or parent has not submitted the IPASS certification, we will be sending them over to a secondary area where an administrator will be able to either contact parents or ascertain from the student the answers to the questions and will be able to update that badge and have them certified to enter class. But what will really help us out to keep students moving quickly through these checkpoints is that each student has had the certification completed in the morning. I did get a question in the Q&A regarding um, practicing using the screening um, once we have the cohorts finalized, we'll be sending out messaging on how to use the iPass. It actually is a very um, quick and easy process. As long as your email uh, address is coded correctly in Aries, um, if, you, if that's all, all correct, then you'll get that email and it's just a few clicks to answer the survey. So we're gonna be available to help troubleshoot that um, if we have any issues, uh, but it is actually a very easy process. We just need to make sure that we're getting it done every day. So um, going back to the checkpoints, as students go through the checkpoint, if their badge is uh, scanned easily and it, it's green and they're ready to go in, they'll be able to proceed very quickly through that checkpoint. I also um, wanted to draw some attention to other ways in which we're helping to keep students in separate groups to the extent that's possible. So if we could proceed to the lunchtime protocol. Great. And as Mr. Sportel talks about this one, here, here is where we started thinking about relationships and reminding ourselves that our eighth graders spent a half a year together. And this is a great opportunity for them to end their eighth grade year together uh, during lunchtime where they could... Um, socialize, socially distance, um, and be able to be together. And also with our seventh graders, an opportunity for them to get acquainted with each other as we prepare for hybrid and also for them to know each other now, build relationships as they think about their eighth grade year as well. Uh, so with that, our groupings are really based on that. 
And we wanted to also let them experience both sides of the quad and the field. And so um, Mr. Sportel will go and talk a little logistics about that. Thank you, Mr. Ortega. And just to uh, dovetail off of that point, uh, the students, um, especially uh, students in seventh grade that are really coming to our campus for the first time, uh, this experience of um, finally getting that opportunity to socialize in person with their peers is really important to us. And it's something that we uh, are keeping in the forefront as we make these plans. Um, so what you'll see in this, uh, this map is the two separate areas that we'll have for um, the different groups. And like Mr. Ortega articulated, we want to make sure that we rotate that schedule on a weekly basis. And the way that I typically describe the schedule is I describe it from the perspective of a student. So if I'm a seventh grade student and I'm in cohort A, I'll be coming to school on Mondays and Thursdays. And so I'll know that every Monday I'll be in the quad area. And the other day that I come to school that week on Thursday, that will be my day to be in the field and blacktop area. Uh, we just finalized plans with our cafeteria staff in our serving of the lunch. And you'll notice that both of these areas, A and B, are near the cafeteria. And if we could also advance the slide to number 20. Um, so that we can get that in Spanish as well. Um, they're both adjacent to the cafeteria. So as you may know, um, some of you who are experienced with our campus know that we do have um, lunch serving windows here on the side of the cafeteria, and we'll be utilizing those for the students in zone A, and that's where they'll come to get their lunch. Zone B will be served from the front of the cafeteria, and they'll be bringing the lunch, out, the lunch service out. Um, a couple things that are important to know. One is that uh, we will be providing lunch to students free of charge. They will not need to have an account or to enter their student numbers. That's going to help us uh, move to the line more quickly. And that it will be a grab and go prepackaged uh, lunch scenario, similar to what we've been providing daily um, in, the, in the drive up. So students will be quickly through those lines. They're gonna be served outdoors. And students will uh, have tables and chairs and areas provided within each zone to be able to enjoy their lunch. Great, thank you, Mrs. Wartell. And so this speaks to the attestation that we were talking about um, and also the implementation and the details. Um, one of the things that we know, going back to what I said earlier, how we practice is how we perform. Uh, we will have ample opportunities to guide students through these procedures um, and really ensure that we set them up for success. Now, as we close out our webinar for today, I wanted to provide just some closing thoughts. And that is that when we think about this work, um, really validate this and have a conversation with your students, with your kids, um, as we are doing the same here at school, that it's a challenge for the future. Um, and it has been this year. Um, and we also know that when we think about the future, the answers are not all there yet. But what we can do is prepare and be ready for it. Uh, the slide on the bottom is just saying we're future ready. And being future ready is not just a matter of being future ready with our safety plans, but it also means being future ready with what we're going to instruct. And what that means is it requires imagination, tons of imagination. Um, it requires new ways of working together and most importantly, new ways to inspire our students. Uh, inspire so that way they could find a purpose in their learning. And it is a term that I have been exploring even before COVID. Uh, just that concept of future ready, um, but it's really putting the students at the center, making them the center of the learning and making the goal for us that the mm -hmm. education is student-centered, that we're facilitating the instruction, that we're focusing on those skills, 
that we want students to understand uh, and guide them as we prepare them for the next grade level, but also for high school, and as always, college and beyond. And so with that, I wanna thank you all uh, for joining us here today. Uh, one of the beauties of being able to record a webinar is that we're able to post it online and also share it with everybody. We anticipate that once school reopens, we will do more webinars to recalibrate ourselves and go over these procedures, go over these guidelines, and also um, repeat a lot of what we've said, but also give parents opportunities to come in and ask more questions as we get closer to that date. Um, so this will conclude our webinar for today. I wanna give you all at least a five minute break for many of you that will be heading into another webinar. Uh, DP will be doing their webinar next. And so um, go ahead and take your break and then uh, let you join in the other one. And for the rest of you, uh, if you've been joining us for our principal chats, thank you. We welcome you. Keep coming to them. We will have more of those and we will continue to have more webinars as well. So with that, thank you. Let me get myself off stop share and we can give you all a nice farewell. <laughs> have a good day. <laughs>